We have a call and we're now in public session. Um, today we're continuing our series of meetings with the North-South implementation bodies established under the Good Friday Agreement. We will hear from Safe Food Ireland about their work and the importance of ensuring food safety, food hygiene and healthy eating across the island of Ireland. I would like to welcome the following witnesses from Safe Food Ireland, uh, Ray Dolan, CEO, Paul Gibbons, Vice Chair, Patricia Fitzgerald, uh, Director of Corporate Operations, and Dr. Gary A. Kearney, Director of Food Science. In a moment, I'll invite you to give your opening statement, and this will be followed by some questions from the committee. But first, the they required notice. So the notices are, uh, first of all, mobile phones. Before we begin, can I get, remind members? And I always check my own phone when I say this. Uh, and those in the gallery to please ensure that their mobile phones, tablets, etc., are switched off completely for the duration of the meeting as they cause interference, even on silent mode, with the recording equipment in the committee rooms. Um, also, I must remind members of the long standing parliamentary uh, practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise, or make charges against a person or body outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable or is identifiable. By virtue of section um, 17 subsection 2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence given to the Joint Committee. If they are directed by the, the chairperson to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, they are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of their evidence. They are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and they are asked to respect the parliamentary practice that, where possible, they should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identify. I would now like to invite uh, Mr Dolan to make his opening statement. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee members for the invitation here today. Um, there's no need for me to do the introductions. You've already done the introductions. Thank you. I would add one little comment to it. Uh, Paul Gibbons, who is our vice chair, as you quite rightly outlined, he's also a, an environmental health officer in the border area in his day job. So he may, maybe might have a first hand for any some of the questions, perhaps. Um, I, I just, I'll, I'll read through the opening statement, and it's titled uh, The Brexit Potential Implications for Safe Food, the Food Safety Promotion Board. One, a background and general overview. Safe Food is one of six implementation bodies set up under the Good Friday Agreement, is a food safety promotion agency, and as such has no food regulatory role nor involvement in mitigation of the potential implications and consequences to the efficient and effective post-Brexit operation of the food control framework on the island. <clears throat> Safe Food's mandate covers both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and accordingly, we have to operate in two jurisdictions that may have two different legislative frameworks post-Brexit for a variety of aspects that may impact the effective operation of food safety and nutrition promotion. These frameworks include food law, public health, employment law, taxation, pension law, data protection law, human rights, freedom of information, and controls on movement of people, goods, services, and capital, the four freedoms of the single market. It is expected that the political, legislative and operational consequences of Brexit for safe food will only become apparent towards the completion of the withdrawal agreement and or transition period. Safe food has identified the following potential uh, Brexit issues that may have implications for both safe food's legislation ma mandate and framework within which it operates and general operation processes. Two, the Good Friday Agreement basis for North-South working and the barriers to effective working the border. There has been much commentary and speculation as to the effects of Brexit in regards to the uh, 1998 Good Friday Agreement and the potential significant risk to both community cohesion in Northern Ireland and the cross-border north-south dimension on the ongoing peace and reconciliation process. The Good Friday Agreement is an international agreement registered with the UN, with Ireland and the UK acting as co-guarantors and is financially supported by the EU. A priority interest of all parties is, of course, the avoidance of a hard border on the island of Ireland. One of the most valuable outcomes of the EU cross-border programmes has been the facilitation of multi-level cross-border networks, where partnership working has affected a real change in culture for the civil society organisations. Potential implications for Safe Food. Safe Food has operated in both jurisdictions for over 18 years, running programmes on food safety and public health nutrition, promotional activity for both consumers, food producers, regulators, public health professionals, scientists and academics. 
it is not alone just focused on enhancing knowledge and encouraging positive behaviour change, but also developing cross-border working partnerships and collaboration. The possibility of a hard border or barrier will make the achievement of our objectives far more challenging in terms of encouraging and fostering multidisciplinary and multisectorial collaboration. For Safe Food, a hard border will actively discourage partnership, joint working, be a barrier for those who wish to choose to collaborate, and a reason for those who do not value North-South cooperation to obstruct meaningful work and mutual benefit. Possible legislative changes to the uh, Good Friday Agreement and potential implications for Safe Food. In the absence of any legislative changes, Safe Food would still continue to function. However, the cost of North-South working and the cooperation would increase as a result of the likely emergence of new practical and policy uh, impediments to meaningful collaboration and the necess necessity for two different strategic and tactful, tactful approaches to public health promotional activity North and South. Three, Safe Food external function and operations, the general North-South partnership working and the potential implications for Safe Food. Common EU legislation, policies, guidelines and approaches have supported Safe Food's ability to deliver its remit and functions of promote, promoting food safety and healthy eating across the island of Ireland, promoting North-South cooperation, which is the inherent part of our work and may adversely affect once Brexit is complete. Certainly the introduction of a hard border would be seen as a major obstacle to joint working. It would be far more difficult to initiate and sustain effective North-South working relationships. As a North-South body, SafeFood has successfully operated in both jurisdictions since inception, and an open border has facilitated openness, aware of others working in similar fields, and opportunity for various organisations to partner and work together for mutual benefit. SafeFood has firmly established itself as constructive working partners with organisations across the island of Ireland, and have established a strong network of stakeholder relationships. With the approval staff count at only 30 and a challenging work portfolio, these relationships are key and essential to achieving Safe Food's legislative mandate and objectives. At present, staff based in Cork headquarters travel to and from uh, work in Northern Ireland repeatedly, a significant journey and sacrifice. The introduction of a hard border post-Brexit will, in the absence of a staffed Northern Ireland office, and we are the only body that doesn't have a, an office in Northern Ireland or permanent presence in Northern Ireland, pose a tremendous challenge to both our capability and capacity to identify and provide local and regional public health promotional services across Northern Ireland. It would be anticipated that a hard border will only accentuate present challenges facing, faced by staff and the core need to have a sustainable and valued safe food presence in Northern Ireland. Four, the divergence of public health and food safety legislation standards and guidelines and the potential implications for safe food. The future regulatory landscape in the UK is not clear other than the passing of the Great Repeal Bill for the all current EU legislation. There is a strong potential for regulatory divergence in food safety legislation and standards between the EU and the UK, but over what time scale is uncertain. A key determinant shall be the final political decision around access to markets and possible tariffs. There may be a hierarchy of standards in the UK, for example UK based food producers exporting into the EU will need to comply with EU law, but those applying the domestic UK market may not. Furthermore, as the UK produces only 54% of the food it requires, it will need to import significant quantities of food, perhaps from non-EU regions across the world where standards are typically not as robust as those set in place by the EU. This aspect is particularly relevant given the porous nature of the border on the island. The key question is whether the final negotiations will agree on food safety regulatory equivalence or alignment. The introduction of any divergence in legislation, policies, guidelines and approaches governing food uh, safety and public health nutrition in two jurisdictions, North and South, will pose complexity and challenges for safe food in delivering its remit and functions. Presently, food safety legislation has its origins in EU directives and re regulations and therefore most organisations involved in the food chain, North and South, are complying with the same set standards by, by, by the regulators. The agri-food sector is very significant in both economies and any divergence in food safety standards affecting, for example, manufacturing, labelling, packaging standards and certification between the UK and the EU will lead to complications for the food sectors on the island of Ireland and to confusion and concern among consumers. Significant divergencies in areas of food safety will pose immediate challenges in regard to safe food promotional programmes and activities for food producers 
uh, and processors, and generally the science of academic communities. There are varying options, uh, varying opinions as to the degree and nature of those potential legislative divergencies. Food labelling aspects, including the removal of the country of origin labels and producer name and address, have been mentioned in addition to possible changes to labelling of various types of meats and substitute ingredients together with new guidance on aspects such as fresh and pure, natural, vegetation and vegan. The UK may review used by and best before date periods to take what they consider to be a sensible and practical guidance. However, the most practical changes will come in the area of interpretive nutrition information including traffic light labelling. A very realistic example of potential divergence in the public health area can already be found in the August 2016 report, Childhood Obesity, a Plan for Action, published uh, by the UK government, which states, and I quote, the UK's decision to leave the European Union will give us great flexibility to determine what information should be presented on packaged food and how it should be displayed. We want to build on the success of our current labelling scheme and review additional opportunities to go further and ensure that we are using the most effective ways to communicate information to families. This might include clearer visual labelling, such as teaspoons of sugar, to show consumers about the sugar content in a packaged food and drink." End of quote. Were the divergence to be significant and the need for safe food to develop jurisdictional specific programmes re realised, there would be significant additional operation costs if safe food has to develop two separate versions of media promotional campaigns, resources and advisory guidance. Such activity will require substantial additional external support and assistance in view of the staff cap and notably the increase in opportunity costs. So regulatory stab stability in, in the UK will essentially, as a non-tariff barrier such as border delays, transport and ingredients, back and forth for single finished food products, etc. It should also be noted that the UK will now have to set up specific food standard validation functions currently exercised by the EU written, uh, risk assessment and communication from EFSA, surveillance of ECDC, etc. Will these functions be robust and acceptable to current EU models? Five, data and information sharing and the potential implications for safe food. Data and information exchange, which is essential to safe food's evidence-based promotional role, has worked well between state agencies and organisations in both jurisdictions. This will willingness has been facilitated by enhanced north-south working relationships and through our shared membership of EU, Northern Ireland and Republic, public health and food safety families and bodies such as the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland, the HSE, the Food Standards uh, Authority of Ireland, the Food Standards Authority UK and EFSA. In addition, Safe Food's well-developed research function acc accumulates significant volumes of raw and aggregate data and information from research projects completed by various academic and other institutions in both the ROI, NI and the UK. Presently, EU data protection laws put restrictions on movement of data outside the European economic area and accordingly a significant divergence in data protection legislation in the UK could pose an insurmountable obstacle for the type of data and information sharing that forms the key evidence base that underpins all our consumer and food supply chain messaging and guidance and indeed our priority legislative function. Six external activities and administrative issues. Um, when procuring goods and services, will one EU tendering process be replaced by a dual EU and UK tendering process? Will there be any issue with retaining our website address, which at the moment is safefood.eu? Will mutual recognition of qualifications continue post-Brexit? Will the legal status of contracts entered into with UK organisations before and after the exit date be affected? Will the basis, contractual and otherwise, of the commissioning of research by Safe Food be impacted? Will changes in the common tr trade and travel area between the UK and the Republic of Ireland impact on staff and board and committee, members, speakers at events, travelling between and working in uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic and vice versa? The risk of currency fluctuations between Euro and Sterling? And can the cross-jurisdictional North-South pension scheme, which supports all six North-South bodies, continue to exist? Right. Uh, does anyone else want to come in? No. Okay. We'll open up to members. Brendan. Um, thank you very much, Chairman, and I, I welcome Mr. Dolan and his colleagues and thank him for the detailed presentation. And it's great to have a, a, an all Ireland body here that's doing good work in a very quiet manner, probably. It's, you, you've, you, you were established, um, and of course, the genius of the Good Friday Agreement was, was the 
bringing together and working together new areas that people hadn't envisaged that we would have such cooperation on an all-Ireland basis and indeed on an east-west basis between Ireland and Britain and further afield to the other 26 members of the European Union apart from Britain and ourselves. Um, I think you, you outlined very, very clearly the practical difficulties that would emerge for an organisation like yourselves. Now you're, you outline that you're a small organisation, but you carry out very, very important work. And from, from a previous position I held, I was very familiar with your work when I served as Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. And um, yet that message across is so important. So it is. And again, I like the phraseology you used about the open border, the fact that people work on the all-Ireland basis and, 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 and that, that natural evolution of the work emerged without people um, shouting political slogans or waving flags of any sort. It, it, was, it, was, it, it was doing things on a practical basis, contributing to a better society and to a better Ireland and to an all-Ireland context. That's the really heartening thing that has happened with all of these bodies. And indeed, it has happened in the private sector as well, where the, where the Good Friday Agreement gave us the environment for businesses to, to be established on an all-Ireland basis. Like, if you take the area of food, that, that's your specialty as well. We have so many um, food industries today that were exclusively north or south in the past. Today, a huge amount of them, thankfully, thankfully are all-Ireland businesses. Um, um, you mentioned, I, I hope I'd be right in differing with you, the hierarchy of standards in Britain. I have two views on that, <laughs> contradictory views. I don't think the British consumer will, 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 will allow a dumbing down of standards in food production. I don't think the, the consumer will. Um, and you know the way I would sincerely hope, because Britain exports substantial, they export substantial amounts of food too, they won't want to lose the markets that they have because of the, of the high regulatory standards that they work to today, as well as we do. Now, the, the, we know very well to our cost over many, many decades that Britain had a cheap food policy that killed our farming sector for so many decades. I sincerely hope that don't go back to that. But there's, I presume that's where you're coming from. Not that they would try to implement deliberately a cheap food policy. I'm not going to suggest that about any government in any country. But um, the imports from countries where standards are much lower than ours, that has to be a worry. There's no doubt about that. And you know, we, we have often people talking about climate change, environmental protection and all of that. And at the same time, those people were advocating that we reduce production of food in Ireland and the Western Europe. And at the same time, that would be replaced by food produced in less environmental, less sustainable systems coming from South America, with all the attendant environmental damage that that would do. Um, there is that, that difficulty there if, if food comes in that way into Britain and comes over the border then. There, there is that a real, a real difficulty there, but I would sincerely hope that, the, that the, the British government, its agencies and its people wouldn't agree to a dumbing down in food standards. And I think the message that you give out today is very, very important about the, about the, about the great cooperation that happens on a daily basis without anybody getting up and talking about political ideology or whatever, from whatever tradition people want to come. It's just that, that, that I welcome the engagement and compliment the Cahirlock on, on, uh, and the support staff in arranging for you to make the presentation. I think the public at large don't, aren't made aware often enough of what has flowed from the Good Friday Agreement and the practical work that's going on out there on a daily basis by yourselves, by your colleagues, and by your sister organisations as well. And I know that's in the structured way from the, from the organisation that evolved from the Good Friday Agreement, but it's, it's happening in so many other ways as well, similarly in the private sector and other public agencies as well. So you might come back um, just about the hierarchy, the hierarchy of standards. I sincerely hope that my gut instinct would be right in that they won't go for a dummy down of standards or they won't be buying our food products if they do. Thank you, Cahirling. Thank you.
I totally agree with everything you said, Deputy. And that, the difficulty is the, the food that would come in from South America. But if it's, if, it's a, if it's any encouragement, I know it gave me great encouragement there in the last six months, being in London and meeting the chair of the Food Standards Agency. And she was really gung-ho about the standards that had been achieved over the years under EU legislation. And she was going to do everything in our, in our power to maintain that, uh, whatever the outcome of Brexit was going to be. And I, think, I thought that was very, very encouraging. She was definitely on the same, same page as ourselves. Okay. Um, uh, Declan, sorry. Uh, just to welcome you also here today, I think it's great to see a presentation like this. Um, I have to say, I remember attending some of the first consultative forums uh, in relation to the issues that were going to impact, and that was at a very early stage, and food clearly was one of them. And uh, I can remember it being played down very much, but it clearly has come to the fore. Uh, obviously by people like yourselves flagging and uh, ra raising the core issues. Uh, for, me, for me, coming from a border constituency, too, 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 too long in the tooth not to have remembered probably the more recent horse scandal, uh, the foot and mouth in the Curly Peninsula, uh, BSE on an ongoing basis and even the reintroduction of a case last week in Scotland. So, in effect, it, it, it reminds us every time we see this about the importance of food safety. I'd like to acknowledge uh, your role in food safety for a start and the public health and nutrition programmes, and that would come on the basis of having spent 35 years as a primary school teacher and seeing the programmes that you have brought, uh, not just into the schools, but indeed going home to the families. Uh, I just want to touch on you know, what you've said, the barriers to effective working, and the whole idea was that there would be no barriers, and uh, barriers or potential barriers seem to be the order of the day. Uh, the, obviously, the breakout sessions that came through the very consultative forum, forum included, obviously, the agri and agri-food people. I'm just wondering to what degree uh, the food producers are contacting you for advice, uh, and equally, uh, that feed in, say, to the LEOs, uh, the local enterprise board, and, and because the experience has been that a lot of them, you know, lately are starting to realise we've got to make an effort and, 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 and make changes or, or certainly be ready for any changes. And I did raise this at the last meeting, uh, and you've referenced it there, which stood out to me as one of the, the very last items where you listed the dangers. Uh, the, the external activities, administrative issues. I'm interested in your take on the tendering process, uh, because uh, the ability for people to tender within uh, food production, if there is a Brexit or a real Brexit, as to how you see that, uh, you know, will there be a, a British standard, a real structure possibly, a British standard as opposed to a, uh, the European standard that we have, because certainly, uh, you know, where we all want to see the thing dovetail and hopefully everybody will sing off the one hymn sheet. There's always the difficulty and to what degree that has been examined and just finally to uh, wish you well in your endeavours. I, I do think the document that you presented is atypical of, of what an awful lot of other companies, be they small or big, have got to do and, and, and to be ready and make sure that uh, nothing is missed out because I go back to what I said at the outset. I remember being pahooed, to use the phrase, uh, by a minister when I flagged this as being something that needed to be looked at uh, very seriously, and I'm glad that you've taken it seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Uh, thank you, Deputy. I'll take your second question first, and then I might hand over to, the, to, to, to Gary. Um, in regard to the, the, the procurement, we don't actually know, of course. Um, and of course, m all of, most of these issues are common to a lot of organisations. They're not unique to us. Um, but we just don't know what the, what the final Brexit may look, look like. So the procurement thing, we don't know. We, we would hope, like the standards we spoke about earlier, um, would be very similar. We just don't know. Um, in relation to uh, 
to processors and we um, last year uh, started to conduct uh, workshops for SMEs and Gary is, is his responsibility and I might ask him for his comment on them. So we don't actually see too many processors coming through the front door but yet when we put these workshops together and we have them dotted around, around north and south and around the island, um, they certainly come through the front door in their droves. Um, so, and they're, they're a wonderful example of how uh, partnership works, but also in the ability to, to, uh, to communicate with processors. Gary, you might like to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Ray. Um, as part of our promotional role, um, um, promoting food safety, we do hold quite a number of workshops with food SMEs especially um, across the island. And the focus of those workshops is not focusing on legislation or guidelines or, or anything relating to that, because our sister agencies look after that element of it. But what we focus on is really education around food safety, like food hygiene, allergens, what to do, you know, if you receive, you know, an adverse uh, report, how to interpret, um, we say, microbiology results and that sort of thing. So um, very often, as you'll appreciate, um, some food SMEs might have only one or two people. Um, involved and so they won't have the necessary knowledge and everything else so we fill that gap um, this year alone we um, we held 12 different workshops across the island uh, they didn't raise brexit uh, they tend to approach the FSCI uh, or the food standards agency and so um, in terms of, of working with Leos we do work with them but again it's this context um, it's I suppose food safety is just one of maybe a dozen different things that a food SME has to think about yet it's the core element if they get food safety right Wrong, the whole house of cards com comes tumbling down. Um, so it's, it's trying to increase and upskill um, the agencies, or the, sorry, the food SMEs, in terms of their, uh, their education, their capacity to provide good food safety in the production of their food. Um, and we try to do that in, in a very, we're a promoter, we don't have a big stick. And so we're facilitators, we try to encourage um, various organisations to come together. We've done that for the guts of 20 years. And that's why an open border is fantastic, because it creates um, um, awareness of others working in the same field, uh, develop a strong network of stakeholders, and we get various organisations working together. Um, one, one example, uh, just not to labour the point, is we got a number of food microbiology laboratories together from the two jurisdictions who hadn't liaised or, or worked or together before, uh, got them together, um, developed an agenda around their core issues. We stepped back and moved it on. And the knock-on of that particular um, initiative were uh, laboratories in Northern Ireland going and auditing those in the South voluntarily. So it was all about developing relationships, working relationships around common areas is, and it's mutual benefit. It's not just doing it for the sake of doing it. There is, there's a value in it. Um, and we try to do that um, as well with, the, with the, the workshops. We bring various partners in, like our sisters age, sister agencies, and those people who can give some value to those small companies producing food. Frank. Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. And um, you're very welcome uh, today. And, uh, you know, I see that you're one of the six implementation bodies set under the Good, up under the Good Friday Agreement. And I know um, firsthand like the partnership and collaboration, and you rightly said, uh, Gary, the, the, the relationships, and these are things that you can never put a value on, and those relationships have built up in the last 30 years. And we see it in politics. Uh, we have relationships uh, cross-border, indeed, Ireland and the UK, and those friendships and relationships endure through difficult times. So you can never put a value of what the work you've done the last 20 years, but it is very, very positive. Just a, a few uh, issues. Um, the, the possibility of a hard border will make the achievement of objectives far more challenging, and it could discourage uh, partnerships and, and joint working and a barrier for those who wish to collaborate. And you did say that, um, that you were, uh, were concerned about uh, any divergence in food safety st standards affecting manufacturing and labelling and packaging standards, standards and certification to the UK and the EU. Could we just bring out one product? You know, maybe what could the, the, the issues regarding one product uh, occur if there was a hard border? that maybe you could, maybe butter or something like that, or is there, do you have a product that we could, you know, from a kind of a day-to-day a, a, a -day issue that you could determine what could happen if there was a hard border? 
Um, well, there's two elements there as well. The harp order, and does then does regulatory divergence. In terms of your your first question, in terms of um, harp order. A harp order won't stop safe food from, from fulfilling its mandate and doing it well, as we have, like I said, for 20 odd years. Um, it does, uh, I suppose it's the convenience uh, that people might experience going north, south, and south, north, if there is a harp order. And how that might impact, or might, for example, make the sustainable relationships building part a wee bit longer, might take more time. So uh, we, we, it's a challenge, but we, we have many challenges, and we'll get over that challenge. Um, so it might be at a slower rate, um, especially when you're developing new relationships. We have great networks already in place, and they'll continue. So in regard to developing new networks, um, you know, you wouldn't want a, a hard border. In regard to kind of a particular food, that, um, again, this is speculation because we don't know what the United Kingdom is going to do regarding new or uh, amending uh, existing food standard legislation. But if you take, for example, and I'm speculating here because I have no knowledge, um, supposing um, the United Kingdom decided to remove best before dates, just as, a, as, a, as, a, and as a, an example. And they might do that for very, very good reasons, because best before generally related to a quality issue. It's not a safe issue. Take your tin of beans. They're best before. Um, if you eat them six months after the best before, it mightn't taste very well, but they're still safe to eat. Whereas used by dates are the, the, the deadline, the critical one for perishable foods. So supposing you had um, food products in the United, produced in the United Kingdom with no best before. So that wouldn't exactly dovetail with, with the EU legislation. So what might happen there? I don't know. So it's, it's that sort of, um, then again, like there are other ways for, from a promotional point of view from ourselves in terms of um, nutritional standards. Um, the, the, the use of the nutritional pyramid is, is, is in the Republic. They have a plate in Northern Ireland and the UK. We get around that, we get on with it. We have just two different approaches, two different ways of approaching our audiences, so we can do that. Um, so in, in terms of our promotional activity, we can work around. Definitely. But in terms of various foods that where the labelling is significantly different, that will be a matter for government and regulatory agencies to, to, to work their way through that one. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think what you presented today is just another example of the challenges that um, are thrown up by Brexit. And we've had so many presentations from people and each one draws up a new area that we hadn't been thinking about and this is certainly you know a, a extremely challenging I think and we still don't know if we're going to have a hard deal soft deal no deal so I don't envy anybody trying to work within that environment I think we've a long way to go on the labeling of food so what you've been saying today is suggesting that it's going to could be even more problematic now and my first question is in relation to genetically modified foods are we going to be more exposed or would Northern Ireland be more exposed um, to them um, secondly, you know, um, uh, the 30 staff that you have, I was just trying to get a handle on where exactly they are, what particular areas they're in. And I'd love to know one or two of the healthy promotion, health promotion um, initiatives that you have been involved in, um, in the, the island of Ireland. Um, and Paul, I'd love to know what exactly you do from the our environmental end, because, you know, I was at a presentation in the AV room yesterday where the Green Party had brought in a number of people, environmental activists, I think, working in the north, in the six counties, and it was certainly frightening to hear some of the things that were going on there, whether it was the River Fahan or an application for a pig farm or other aspects like that. And in the absence of an executive, in the absence of a government, it seems, and there's some very alarming things going on, including this gold mining company, Canadian company, that are coming in, and the impact on the environment. And of course, that affects food production as well. So, thank you. I, I, I'll, I think there's a bit for us all in there, but I'll start with the, maybe the easier one is the 30 staff. Um, we're, our headquarters is in Cork, as I said, and there would be roughly two thirds of the staff in Cork, and that would take a corporate services side of the house, corporate operations, the food science people, the human health and nutrition people. Um, and then in Dublin, we have about 10, and they're the marketing and communication and PR 
people. Um, so that's the way that's the way they're spread out. And just going back to you know the the, the partnerships and the travelling over over, it's difficult to get both staff to go to to Belfast to a meeting or to Armagh or to Newry and then back to Cork. And equally, it's difficult to get people when you're building relationships with new people and you try to get them to go to Cork. So that's where we have the Dublin office too. And of course, the flight from Belfast to Cork ceased there unfortunately after the, it, it crashed some years ago, and that was a, was a big disadvantage to us because we, we used it quite a lot and it was very handy to put them back in the one day. Um, in regard to, I'll maybe hand over to Paula. And, and yeah, no, I work in environmental health, food safety regulation, so I'm based in Monning, so we're just right on the border there, so I have that cross-border dimension as well. Um, again, we have our concerns along the border. Um, the reality is, where there has been a price differential in products both sides of the border, there are people willing to exploit that. Um, again, we'd have concerns if some of these products, genetically modified foods, chlorinated chicken, the whole raft of products that may be legal in the UK are allowed to be on the island of Ireland. Uh, on the northern side of the border, we'd have concerns they may make their way into the uh, southern and the European food chain. So, as, so that's one of the main challenges for, for us as the regulator. And you know, we have the commitment of the backstop at the minute that there's going to be lime the standards on the island, but obviously, depending on you know, how negotiations go over the next few weeks, that may or may not be um, implemented. And if it isn't, you're into a hard Brexit with all associated threats to food safety on the island. So, I mean, that would be. Just from my perspective along the border, that would be a, one of the main and immediate threats for us um, after next March. Thanks, Paul. Gary might tackle the GMOs. Um, in terms, I, I'm not too off a with UK policy regarding GMOs, so um, I can't speculate as to, you know, post Brexit, whether the UK will go in a different direction to the European Union. Um, I suppose to be fair to say that UK philosophy around animal welfare and everything else is very, very positive. So one would hope that there would be a meeting of minds there, but I'm not aware of, of their position. Um, if I may, in terms of an example of um, some campaign that we might have run, um, we focus in, in terms of food safety, we focus in terms of our public campaigns, we focus on helping those in the domestic kitchen, all of us here who cook in the kitchen, focusing around the four C's, which is cooking, chilling, uh, um, cooking, chilling, cleaning and avoiding cross-contamination. So we use various ads, uh, radio and so on, promotional tools to get the message across. One example, we had um, a good collaboration with the Food Standards Agency in Northern Ireland around Don't Wash Your Chicken, which was news to most people up to three or four years ago. Um, a campaign done uh, very, very efficiently and produced, and the results from that indicated that one in four of us who used to wash chicken before now doesn't. Um, other, uh, other, I suppose, um, work we do would require, would focus on those who are more vulnerable. A lot of us can survive, you know, about a food poisoning, but the most vulnerable in terms of the elderly, the very young, those immunosuppressed and young children. Um, we need, to, we focus on, on, on those particular population if you like, a group, in groupings quite a bit. So um, at the moment we are developing, for example, a hand washing campaign in the preschool sector, which you'll hear about next month. Um, again, providing staff in, in those facilities to tutor and to, to help children develop a core skill of hand washing and to take it home and to get parents to again to, to, to continue the lesson. Um, hand washing is, is a core, it's probably one of the most important things we can do to avoid food poisoning. So it's a smart thing, they're a vulnerable group but also young children are like sponges and they can be you know advocates on our behalf in terms of, 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 of um, good, good public hygiene. I might add one, one uh, to, to that. One of our campaigns is a community food initiative, uh, which is a local initiative that aims at community groups, and we fund them, and it's not a very expensive funding, but to, to inc increase awareness about food, show people what, where in the supermarket to get the, the cheap cuts, the, the good nutritional cuts, show them cook, bring, the, bring it home then, show them cooking skills and improve, improve their availability to access safe and healthy food and that's proved a wonderful success in communities. Sure. I, just, um, I don't know if you're involved in the, this initiative with some of the supermarkets that food just past the sell-by date that it's being used by other groups and of course it's still very, very safe to use and I think that's been very good because when we think about the amount of waste wastage in food that, that goes on. It's just terrible. And then I'm just conscious, yesterday the Healthy Ireland survey came out um, and 
you know, there are sections in all of our constituencies, I have it in Dublin Central, where parts of that society are much more unhealthy. They're more liable to smoke, to binge drink, um, to be overweight, etc. Um, and again, there's a whole space there for, you know, an education and awareness on that, which I think is vital. That's just a couple of questions myself. Um, you were saying about the staff cap, maybe expand on that, and you were also talking about, you know, the an office in the north, you know, would facilitate in relation to that. Um, one of the things we were, we, uh, a number of us were over at the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, and I suppose one of the issues came up, Britain is a bridge for uh, goods uh, to, you know, for trade and so on, uh, and the dependency in relation to for Ireland to get to the goods there. Uh, if there's any concerns in relation to that, do you get involved in that thing, or have you, you know, uh, submitted stuff in relation to that? Uh, technology checks, you know, this thing, the famous technology, in relation to food, you know, again, have you looked at, you know, cost factors in relation to that? Um, the, uh, you talk in terms of, uh, yet yeah, uh, safe food will continue to function, however, the cost of north-south working and cooperation would increase as a result of likely emergence of new practical impediments to meaningful cooperation. Have you got a, you know, a price? You know, do you have a, a, an idea of the, the funding in relation to that? And uh, what else? Um, that's the staff. And yeah, there were there were a number of questions that struck me in relation to it. But I thought in relation to the GMOs, you know, Britain talks in terms of, you know, they're all talking about new trade, and I suppose the worry is the, you know, the trade between the US and you know GMO foods. You know, there's most of the foods there. You know, and that's the. And that's the leak, it's and I suppose the big worry that people would have. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll um, p p take some of those questions. In regard to the staff cap, it's, it's what I mean by this, uh, the staff cap is in 1999 there was approval for 30 staff. It's still 30 staff. Um, so, and we, you know, with, with the Brexit situation, if it was a difficult or a hard Brexit, and we would need probably a few additional, not, nothing huge, a few additional staff, um, because again, if we're running. At the moment, we, we, we run 99% of our campaigns on the island of Ireland, so we just take the, 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 the consumers as, as one. Um, but if you're going to have to tweak uh, your, your, um, your campaign, it's, there's going to be a cost to that. So instead of having one radio ad, you're going to have to have two radio ads. You're going to have one TV ad, you may have to have two, uh, just to, so that the, the, the information is applicable to the jurisdiction you're, you're airing in. Um, so th there will be a cost to that. We again, we're more waiting to see what kind of a Brexit turns out before we can do that. Have you had discussions, for instance, with the Irish government in relation to staffing needs and revelation, you know, pending what's coming down the track? Or what, who is the structure you go to? Is it both governments? That it, well, it's both, yeah, both departments yeah. of health and then the NSMC. Unfortunately, with no executive in the north, um, the NSMC is not sitting. There's no minister for health in the north, so it's, 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 there's no approval mechanism there. Uh, now, again, that's not, that's not a problem. That's just a fact of life, and that's been on and off like that for the last uh, 18 years. Uh, so you just work around that. Um, but it's, you know, I think what we're saying is that the time will come sooner rather than later, depending on, the, on what we see as the type of Brexit it is, that we may have to sit down with both governments and say um, what's, what's needed to reshape the, the organisation. I mean, we're 18 years, 19 years. So things have changed, technologies have changed, uh, specialities have changed. So you, when you recruit a particular food scientist in uh, 2000 or 2001, that person's skills have completely changed in 2018. And you, so it, it would be a welcome, welcome opportunity on that. Um, Northern Irish, Irish Office, yeah, well, well look, we've, we've, we've struggled with this from, from day one. Um, I'd say it's, it's, again, it's difficult to, to um, put a business case together. It's difficult to get an acceptance of, you know, look, if, if, if it's not broken, why fix it kind of attitude? You're working quite well in the, in the north, you're based in the south. Um, so the, it, it doesn't just tend, there's no appetite for it, I'd say. You know, again, that's not, not anyone's particular fault. But again, if depending on the colour of Brexit, as it were, we may have to revisit that and, uh, and a stronger uh, business case be made to it.
And the, the, the likes of, you know, this thing of the technology checks and so on in relation to food, you know, is there, has there cost been done or is it, you know, again, is it possible uh, even in relation? I think the, re the regulators are, are working on that yeah. and are looking into the, to, to the, the, the cost of that. That's not something that's coming our way in truth. Yeah, we're, we're a food safety promotion, not regulatory. So to be government and the regulators will, will look at that. Um, um, I suppose it's all about the post-Brexit, is it going to be regulatory equivalence or regulatory alignment, we'll say, um, and to flow from that how things would pan out. But for us, um, there might be two different standards in terms of our food safety promotion. We'll have to track it in two different ways. Um, and that's just a fact of life for us. Um, so I suppose a lot of this will be post-Brexit for us. A lot of the, um, the effects, positive or negative, will be post-Brexit. But it's not going to be simple. Which you know, it's the way it's betrayed in relation to you know those who would. Oh, it will, it. but it may not. Yes. Okay. Right. Anyone else? Again, I'd like to, on, be, on behalf of the Joint Committee, I would like to thank Mr. Dolan and his colleagues for appearing before the Joint Committee today and for answering your questions so comprehensively. And maybe it's something that we, you know, there's particularly in relation to the staff thing, that maybe it's it's an issue that we as parliamentarians might be able to raise at a future date. I propose we now go into private session uh, for a short period for, to deal with business of the committee. Thank you again for, for coming along.